It's a pleasure today to welcome Professor Alessandro Astolfi, who is a professor at uh, Imperial College, London, um, to be our dream seminar speaker. Um, Alessandro is a control theorist, and um, he's been a professor at Imperial College um, since about 1996, yeah. um, when he moved there from Switzerland, um, where he had finished his PhD at ETH Zurich in control, uh, working in um, the kind of area of robust nonlinear, robust and nonlinear control. He also um, has a joint PhD from um, the University of Rome. Um, and, um, and he also, in addition to being a professor at Imperial College, he's also a professor at the University of Rome. Yes. Good. Okay. Um, when I was a graduate student here, I went back to, I did my master's at Imperial, and, and close to the end, I went back to Imperial College to talk with some of the professors I had, including Martin Clark. And at that time, this was around the time you were hired, he called Alessandro, we have our new nonlinear chap here. So whenever I think of Alessandro, I always think of a new nonlinear chap, who's, who's very nice British. Um, Alessandro works in the area of control theory, um, robust, adaptive, nonlinear control. Um, very exciting theoretical work as well as very exciting applications. He's won a number of awards for his work, um, uh, several best paper prizes. Um, he's won the Ruberti Award from um, the Control System Society, um, a number of other awards including the Institute of Measurement and Control Sir Harold Hartley Medal, um, the Philip Leverhulme Prize, um, and um, he's also a fellow of the IEEE and the IFAC. And um, welcome, Alessandro. Thanks. Thanks, Claire. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank, thanks very much for the nice introduction and for the invitation. Uh, as you say, they always have a, a double life. This has always worried my wife that I could have another one somewhere else. So she never figured it out. <laughs> right. Okay. So uh, I. Today I've been, um, I will discuss my work on nonlinear control and the ultimate uh, objective of this line of research that has been going on for about a decade is uh, to try to make nonlinear control, control as constructive as possible. And for all those of you that uh, have been involved in nonlinear control, you always know that there's, you know, it's very easy sometimes to give condition, necessary and sufficient condition for solvability of a problem provided that you're able to solve some partial differential equations. And, you know, these provided, I mean, you know, if you were a mathematician, this would be the end of the story. But as engineers, we at least, I always feel that you have to try to do a bit more than that. You know, sometimes existence conditions are not good enough. And so, and, you know, I would actually have a very brief introduction on the history of PDEs and why PDEs uh, uh, you know, are good or bad, and how they came to be in control. And I have to say that this is a very successful association, the one with, you know, nonlinear geometric control and partial differential equation. But in a certain sense, we have to try to go away from that and try to understand that uh, for us, partial differential equation are a means to an end. And the end is to control a system or to solve an optimal control problem, to, you know, to solve a design problem. So we would like to modify the system. And so we are not too much interested in the solution of the PDE per se, and so that's why we don't want to compute it. So as I said, you know, I would like to very briefly have an history of PDE, and you know, it is quite interesting to understand that PDEs are fairly new objects, so you know, it's very difficult to trace back in time the first PDEs, and they were always considered sort of very negative objects. So we will see, for example, that Newton himself uh, was extremely unhappy about the existence of PDEs. So this is, uh, you know, the, the very, you know, original work on this was done by Euler and then Leibniz. Uh, but they, in a certain sense, they introduce some symbol like the partial derivative without really understanding what is the meaning of this, in, of this symbol. So it's quite interesting uh, to see that uh, in 1694, uh, actually there was the first solution to a PDE. And, uh, but again, uh, you know, 
especially in the work of Bernoulli, PDs was al always regarded as sort of an enemy that should be, should be kept at a distance. So the most interesting citation that you can find in history is in this work of Newton, that during the, the plug in London, he didn't know what to do, and so he started working on uh, integral, that he called fluence, and differentials, that he called fluxions. And his main objective was to exterminate fluxions. Right, so for him, integrating a differential equation was essentially an extermination problem. Right, so uh, it's uh, you know people say that he didn't really have the tools to understand partial differential equation, and this is this is probably right. So only later uh, in the work, you know, on Lagrange and D'Alembert, there was some. Um, uh, some, some initial uh, understanding of partial differential equation. But I would say that the real father of PDs is actually Poincaré in this 1890 paper, where for the first time he, he had an understanding that PDs were actually fundamental to understand physics. And you know, most physical problems can actually set using a, a, an approach to PD. And then, you know, this brings us to PDs in control. And again, the first trace that I could find of PDs in control is in the work of La Lyapunov, where in his uh, 1892 thesis on the general problem of stability of motion, he introduced uh, a partial differential inequalities, actually. And I would say that he actually introduced PDs into control theory. And, you know, for over a century, we have been dealing with PDs in several ways in control. And uh, I have to say that this indeed is the beginning of a very successful relationship between partial differential equation and control theory, to the point that there's quite a lot of people these days that are solving control problems for PDEs, definitely much smarter than me, because I always have big problem understanding this type of control problem. So there is a long list of PDEs in control. Uh, and I have to say that possibly optimal control, despite the complexity of the problem, is one of the very first problems that was studied using partial differential equation. So from uh, uh, optimal control, you naturally go to the hamilton jacobi equation. And then in modern days, although the work is uh, essentially based mostly on Frobenius, um, on Frobenius theorem, you have the idea that partial differential equations show up as a notion to characterize invariance for nonlinear system, clearly to solve feedback linearization and feedback equivalence problem. Kalman, Kalman canonical decomposition for nonlinear system can be given the structure of PDEs. And then, you know, from Yapunov function to control Yapunov function, you have constructive method. Again, you get sort of constrained PDEs. In adaptive control and nonlinear observer, you get injections, which are true gradient or Jacobian matrices. And so, again, you need to be able to integrate some of these. And the notion of center manifold output regulation, model reduction, all these have actually PDEs embedded. And this is also true for Ito's rule. So it should be somewhat obvious that you know, I'm making a strong argument that PDEs are actually a very important tool in control. And most of this problem can actually be phrased using PDEs. Now, the type of PDEs that you typically have are uh, in the first derivative, well, for Ito's rule, you have second derivative. And so you have some function of the partial of whatever, so phi with respect to x, or phi itself and x. And I use a traffic light notation. So whatever is green is always good, red is bad, and amber or yellow. I believe in the US you say yellow, in England we say amber for whatever reason. In Italy you say yellow, actually orange, sorry. Uh, it's always the same color. Right, so whatever is orange uh, or amber or yellow uh, is, uh, is, uh, is undecided. <laughs> okay, so for example, we will see that lots of this problem, I mean, we all know that this problem can be phrased as partial differential equation, but it's actually quite interesting to see that we will be able to solve most of this problem without solving any PDEs. And clearly there is a price that we have to pay and we'll try to quantify how expensive it is to get rid of PDEs in all these problems. Now, for uh, integrable distribution is, problem is largely more difficult because you end up with higher order partial differential equation. For feedback linearization, there is a nice trick of the Lie bracket that allows you to transform high order partial differential equation into a first order partial differential equation. So and the, that's why this is uh, somewhat in, uh, in orange, because you have to be slightly more careful, because doing an approximate transformation of the higher order partial differential equation that you get there into a first order differential equation is, is, is a bit tricky. But so we can actually achieve this. And I have to say that I've not been working on Ito's rule and stochastic stability. But again, this could be all, uh, um, can be all transferred to this. So 
uh, the other important problem is, you know, as a, as a young student, I used to look at all this problem and say, well, I'm pretty sure there's some mathematician that has solved all these partial differential equations, and we don't have to bother about this. And then you start reading books of partial differential equations, and you don't find any of these differential equations. There's good reason why you don't find them. And one of the good reasons is that, for example, we don't have any boundary condition really. I mean, for PDEs, you typically have very strong and very good boundary condition, whereas the type of boundary condition that you have in control is like positivity, or you know, it has to be zero at zero, or, or, or something like this, or you don't even have any boundary condition. If you look at feedback linearization, there's no boundary condition. You try to find the kernel of a distribution, and nothing, nothing more than that. So, and sometimes you also have inequality. If you think of Lyapunov inequality, then you know you would like the time derivative of a function along trajectory of a system to be negative, definite, or semi-definite. But you know there is no really any boundary condition again there. So that's why in every book on partial differential equation you don't find anything, anything particularly useful. Now. It is fairly hard to list all methods and tools to solve partial differential equations that derive existence condition. There are some of these tools which are fairly old, which are based on separation of variables, and they can never be used for control theory. Uh, there is a very interesting interplay between harmonic functions and complex functions. And then uh, Green's function and singular solution of Laplace equation have been studied by clearly Laplace. And most modern methods, like power series method or successive approximation methods, are uh, you know, somewhat more useful for control theory. And, you know, a good proof of this fact is that the successive approximation method was exactly what motivated Lyapunov to study partial differential equation and to come up with, uh, you know, the so-called Lyapunov functions. So if you want to solve PDs for control purposes, this is essentially all what you've got. Right? So if you were a mathematician, you would like to give existence condition for PDEs in control. You can use cauchy kovalevsky theorem. Uh, and this is typically used for non-stationary Hamilton-Jacobi equation. Frobenius theorem, uh, which is actually not due to Frobenius. It's an interesting historical uh, you know, phenomenon. I mean, that's the, the theorem has got his name, but it was not proved by him. Uh, then uh, there is a sort of Schwartz integrability condition, which is used for local solution of first order PDEs. And there is possibly a not very well known result by Arian van der Schaft on the uh, integrability of Lagrangian sub manifolds that provide solution for a particular class of stationary Hamilton Jacobi equation. So, what do we do most of the time? We uh, try to use finite element method and series expansion, but in my opinion, these are inadequate for control. Don't forget that most of the time, we would like to find the solution of a PDE, but we will use the gradient of the solution. We use the derivative of the solution. So, you know, in finite element methods, I mean, clearly, if you're an expert in numerical analysis, you can do a lot of things. But in reality, I mean, you cannot really uh, use this type of method for control purposes. So, this is you know, why I wanted to try to find an alternative way to solve PDEs, which is actually a control, uh, it has a control perspective. So all the solutions which are currently available, as far as I know, they do not scale nicely with the dimension of the problem. So, you know, you can go from dimension three, four, five, and then everyone is talking about curse of dimensionality. And the first question that I always ask is, which dimension is cursed? Three, four, five? I mean, when do you start cursing the dimension? Right? And then, and then we all know that if you have a problem in, you know, an industrial problem, I mean, you get like 5,000 states. It's not like a matter of going from 5 to 6, from 6 to 7, but it's a matter of going from 5 to 100 to 5,000. So this is, uh, in, you know, it's something that we have to keep in mind. Now, there's quite a lot of specific methods, for example, Galerkin approximation with Scotty solution, but, you know, these are not really uh, sort of general purpose methods, and they are useful only for specific classes of partial differential equation. Now, I would say, you know, this is essentially uh, the whole spirit of these lectures. And, you know, in the rest of, of this presentation, there will be a lot of equations. Uh, equations are there because, you know, we all feel safe with equations, right? I mean, mathematicians never write equations. I mean, they know how to use equations. Whereas as an engineer, I don't. I write an equation because I feel safe. But they're just placeholder for concepts, right? So 
My perspective is that when I try to solve a PDE, I'm actually missing the point because the PDE and the solution are instrumental to solve a control problem. And so I'm interested in the solution of a PDE along the trajectories of a system, which is completely different from saying that I'm interested in the solution of a PDE. In a certain sense, I don't want to know the value function V of X. I want to know the value function V of X of T or the gradient of the value function V of X of T. And in, in control, we have an additional advantage that dynamical system are are inherently robust. For example, if you have a stability property, this is inherently robust. So the fact that you have a Lyapunov function or you have a modification of this Lyapunov function or a perturbation is not really a big deal because you know this is a strong property, typically stability or other properties. And you don't want this property to be destroyed only by a small variation. So we have these two principles, which are essentially the guiding principle for all this presentation. Now, the simplest possible PDEs that you can try to solve is a type of, PD, you know, is this first order PDEs where you have a function beta that you would like to find and you know that it's Jacobian is equal to a B of X. Now, in principle, there are integrability conditions on these and this may not even be, uh, be satisfied. So there may be no solution to this, uh, to this equation. And, you know, again, from a mathematician perspective, you could say, well, there's no solution. So what is the next equation that I have to solve? But it may, we will see that this type of condition actually shows up if you want to solve an observer design problem for a nonlinear system or in adaptive control problems. Essentially, you have a sort of injection, which is defined through uh, a Jacobian. And this injection has to be equal to the regressors, for example, in the case of adaptive control problems. So you want to solve a control problem. And so you don't mind really solving a perturbation of these. Now, you could go on in several ways. You could make a small perturbation of these to satisfy integrability condition. But this will be extremely ad hoc. So I use one of the two most powerful tools in mathematics. And you know, I, I used to teach you know, math uh, a few years ago. And I always say to students that there are two tricks in math, adding 0 and multiplying by 1. So in this case, I add 0. But zeros have to be clever. Well, this is not even very clever. But in general, zeros have to be clever. So I will rewrite the partial of beta with respect to x as the same function b evaluated on a different variable x set. And then clearly, I need to add and subtract. So I add and subtract this quantity, and I have to put b of x back. So what happens is that all of a sudden, if I neglect what is on the right, you know, what is in the bracket there, I have something that can integrate it in a very simple way. I mean, because there's no x. Essentially, I'm checking Riemann condition for integrability on the larger space. And I tend, you know, and I observe that this gradient is actually a constant as far as the x is concerned. But then I make a mistake, right? Because there is a mismatch. And you know, you can interpret this mismatch like x hat is a wannabe x, but it's not really x. Right? So how are you going to take care of this? Well, you know, from uh, the perspective of a mathematician, this is like, you know, you cannot take care of this. These are two variables. This is an error, and there's nothing you can do. But for control person, I mean, you say, well, you know, now you have another variable, x hat. And again, as I always said in my control class, control people, as soon as they see a variable, they do a time derivative. I mean, it's like a compulsive, a, a compulsive response, right? Um, <laughs> and so. You know, you look at this, and what happens is that you know x is the state of your system. Although here there's no underlying system, but you, we can, you know, the fact that I call this x is quite obvious. And then I have another variable x hat. X dot is given by the problem itself, but x hat is my at my disposal, so I can do whatever I like with x hat. So I can make sure that actually x hat. Uh, is as close as possible to x. However, we have to be slightly careful because then you will be tempted to say, well, you know, after all, I can say, OK, why don't we set x hat always equal to x? Because if you do this, then this would be the solution of the PD, which is actually not true. So you have to allow some slack in a certain sense. But this slack should vanish asymptotically because you would like to solve your problem asymptotically. So the whole point is that you perform a strange integral, which is actually completely trivial. And then you need to design a dynamical system to compensate for, for the mismatch. And in this way, if, for example, your objective is to stabilize the, you know, the, the, the origin, x is going to go to 0. As long as x set also goes to 0, this injection actually is doing the job. Because asymptotically, this term is disappearing. Clearly, you need to do a good analysis to make sure that things are well defined. But this is essentially the whole, uh, the whole story. So if I call this quantity the dynamic integral only because you know, together with the integral of this, I have to attach a dynamical system. And clearly, if this idea works, I can replace partial differential equations. 
in a lot of control problems with algebraic equation, pretty much like what is done in the so-called theory of state-dependent Riccati equation. However, there is a bit ad hoc. In our case, we provide specific guarantees of what we are actually doing. All right, so I will try now to go sort of through the history of how all this problem was developed and why we came up with these solutions. And uh, um, clearly, I mean, this is like, you know, it's not the presentation that you would give if you write a book on this, because in that way you will try to sort of write things in, in a good way. In this way, it's more like the, how I thought about this problem and how we decided to solve this problem, which I believe is probably going to be easier. And, you know, clearly as we carry on, we, 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 we like this, this, we like this, um, this approach, and then we have been solving more and more problems. I forgot to say that with the exception of the three colors that I mentioned at the beginning, whenever you see another color, this is essentially a random color, right? So I didn't know which one to pick. OK, so suppose that you have a system uh, like this one, uh, so with two states, y and eta, and you want to design an observer, a reduced order observer for eta. Then this is very easily done. Essentially, you partially copy these equations, and then you have to have an injection. Now, the reason why you have this injection through a partial derivative is that you will have uh, an error dynamics, which is a function, function z, which is uh, eta minus c plus a function of y, because this is the way you construct a, a reduced order observer. So you end up with an estimation error dynamics, which is given by this expression. And you see that the main problem is that you know, this is given by the system. And this is your design parameter. And ideally, I would like the partial beta with respect to y to be phi transpose. This is actually the best selection that you could do. Or you know, phi transpose something else if you want to pick a quadratic Lyapunov function for this problem, which makes sense since this is a type of linear time varying system. But the problem is that this is given by the system, so it doesn't have to be a Jacobian. So you know, this problem of making sure that essentially you square this term may not even have a solution. But then the whole trick is that I should replace the injection Jacobian by a dynamic integral, and then I have to extend the dynamical system with a y hat. So I have now an additional variable, and I have to take care of this variable. So the y hat is familiar to all those that have done, for example, adaptive control, and is nothing else than the filtered version of the measured variable. So you measure y, and you filter again this through a dynamical system, but this dynamical system is constructed in such a way that this mismatch that you have uh, constructed, solving in a dynamic way the partial differential equation that is sort of squaring this term, is actually asymptotically vanishing. So and, you know, I, again, you know, I don't want to go too much in details, but to give you an idea, the type of statement that you can make is the following. So suppose that you have a mechanical system with non-anomical strain, and suppose you want to build a velocity observer for this system, and suppose that your observer is to be global. So this problem, actually, as much as from a technological perspective is somewhat trivial, because you can just do a dirty derivative of the position and get the solution. I mean, from a, a theoretical perspective, it's an interesting problem, because you get quadratic nonlinearities here, the uh, non anomic constraints are sort of you know, upsetting a bit the structure of the problem. But so you can actually claim that you can construct a dynamical system, and this dynamical system is actually a state which is uh, sort of fairly big, depends on the dimension of the original problem minus the, the, the number of constraints, and then you have a certain number of filtered variables. So uh, this dynamical system has input deposition and the torque that you are applying on the mechanical system. And then it has an output, which is, uh, again, a, a linear output in the state multiplied by BQ. And the type of result that you can actually prove is that uh, for any alpha, the exponential of alpha t times a sort of estimation error goes uh, asymptotically to 0. And you see that if n has some specific property, actually you can use this to construct an estimate for the velocities q dot. So you have what we call the globally exponentially convergent speed observer. Observe that the error equals 0 equilibrium of the interconnection between this system and the observer is not asymptotically stable. So you don't have stability. You get convergence, but not stability, exponential convergence, but not stability. And then, essentially, you obtain your observer, which is projected if you have a non anomic constraint uh, using these equations. Now, clearly, this is a sort of uh, uh, abstract result in a certain sense and maybe not very useful, but it is. it was actually the first application of the idea that we have seen before. Now, 
this uh, statement as a proposition defined, you know, is an existence condition. And then I said at the very beginning that I don't want to be a mathematician. So despite the fact that the claim is framed as an existence condition is actually constructive for a given mechanical system, I can actually construct bit by bit the speed observed. And this is a very interesting example. So this is an autonomic system, uh, which is called the Kaplan-Jeans lay. And then uh, uh, I actually haven't written the equation of the system here. But then if you write the equation, you have six, uh, uh, six states, three degrees of freedom plus the autonomic constraint, which is associated with uh, uh, this contact point there. And then you need to build the observer. And the observer you know, is constructed in this way, where you have a filter of all the measure states, a filter of the measurements. So you know the three position. You need to find the velocities. You get these additional terms, which are the reduced order observer constraint to the, um, to the, to the constraint space. And you need to add an additional state, which is a norm observer. So these estimate the norm of the unmeasured states. And using these, then you rescale all the variables and you obtain the global result. So as I said, this is somewhat a non um, a non trivial application. But you know, historically, it was the first uh, of all these applications. Right, so follow the sort of constructive approach and constructive result, we decided to look at partial differential equation in control one by one and try to see what we can achieve. And clearly, the whole starting point is Lyapunov, uh, Lyapunov uh, functions. So suppose that I want to study now stability of an equilibrium point of a nonlinear system. And we also all know that this condition is you know, a condition that gives us uh, a guarantee that x equals 0 is an asymptotically stable system. So we need to satisfy this partial differential inequality. And the only constraint that we have is a positivity constraint. So v has to be positive definite. And again, I'm um, on purpose somewhat sloppy. We are not really interested in global result or local result, whether this is uh, radially unbounded and so on. I'm just trying to understand the, the principle of all of this. OK, so. Uh, one possible way of removing the PDEs, so here we have this partial differential equation with the positive inequality with, a, with, with, a, with uh, a positive constraint. And then I could say, well, why don't we look at some vector p with the property that p f, px fx, which is like a scalar product, is non-positive. And then suppose that this system is locally exponentially stable. I would like to have a sort of tangency condition associated with this vector. Because you see, I can actually find a lot of vectors that satisfy this inequality, but not all are going to be good for my, for, my, for my construction. So I take the linearized system, and I define p bar as the solution of the problem for the linearized system. And then I make sure that this vector is tangent at 0 to the solution of the linearized, uh, of the linearized problem. So this seems to be a good starting point. And then we can say, well, I can actually use, uh, well, this idea has already been used in the state dependent three cut equation literature, where you know, v of x has been written as a product of some vector p of x times x. The problem with this approach is that you cannot actually really integrate this object, because if I take this Lyapunov function and compute the time derivative, I have this additional term, and I'm de defeating the purpose of all of this, because I say I want to get rid of PDEs, and then all of a sudden I have a constraint on the partial of p with respect to x. So this is definitely not a good idea. Can we use a dynamic integral in order to solve this? Well, we can actually do this. So what we do, we consider our original system together with a dynamic extension. And alpha is completely at our disposal. Then I want to find a Lyapunov function in a way that is positive definite for x and c in some set. And the partial of v with respect to x is actually the vector p of x that we had before. But then I allow some perturbation. And this perturbation has to be such that whenever x is equal to xe, the perturbation actually is equal to 0. Because as I said, this variable wants to be an x, but it cannot possibly be an x. There is no condition on the partial of v with respect to xe, either than the function itself has to be positive definite. And then I need to define the dynamics alpha, which is completely at my disposal, in such a way that the time derivative of v with respect, you know, the time derivative of v along the trajectories of the system is actually uh, non-positive. And this parameter alpha is a design parameter. So I have as many control on uh, xi as many states as I have. And you know, I would like xi to be a copy of x, so I have n, n, n variable xi. So the whole issue is to try to understand how to handle this, uh, this, 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 um, this perturbation there. 
So I define an object, which I call a dynamic Lyapunov function, which is essentially a pair, a positive definite function on an extended space, and a dynamical system, which is xi dot equal alpha f xi. xi. So a dynamic Lyapunov function is something that I could use to prove uh, asymptotic stability of an equilibrium without solving Lyapunov uh, partial differential inequality. And you can actually do this, and we'll come that, you know, to the construction of the dynamic Lyapunov function in a minute. So you can actually prove that if you have a dynamic Lyapunov function, you can prove that the equilibrium x equals 0 of the original system is asymptotically stable. If you have that the equilibrium is locally exponentially stable, you can claim the existence of a dynamic Lyapunov function. And actually, if you have a dynamic Lyapunov function, you can even claim the existence of a Lyapunov function, provided that, you know, some invariance condition is satisfied. So this seems to be like a nice object to try to prove stability properties, provided they can construct a dynamic Lyapunov function in some constructive way. And actually, I can find the canonical form for this. I can say that once I have this vector p, which is tangent to the solution of the linearized problem at x equals 0, the dynamic Lyapunov function is a pair, which is constructed as p c scalar product with x plus one half a penalty of x minus xi square, and then xi dot is essentially minus a constant. This could also be a function, the partial of v with respect to xi. So this is the type of LG uh, v control for the xi uh, dot. So if an equilibrium point is asymptotically stable for x dot equal f of x, this is a dynamic Lyapunov function. So I can construct it without any additional, uh, without any additional constraint. Right, so a very simple example. I, you know, I'm flying at 8.30, so at some point I will have to finish, right? Okay, so this is a global asymptotically stable system. You can define a dynamic Lyapunov function simply using the approach that we have in a, in, a, in a completely trivial way. And actually, if you're able to solve this partial differential equation, you can then wrap around this dynamic Lyapunov function into actually a Lyapunov function. It's quite interesting to observe that, first of all, you get a family of Lyapunov functions. But you see that this is a much simpler object. The dynamic Lyapunov function has got a linear dynamics and then is a quadratic function, whereas the actual Lyapunov function for the original system is much more uh, complicated. I mean, the construction is, is more involved. Right, so we have a Lyapunov function, and then why don't we look at, uh, you know, optimal control? So now the problem is, uh, you know, is an optimal control problem, an infinite horizon problem, where, you know, we have standard assumption, detectability assumption, stabilizability assumption, and then the classical solution to the problem is through the solution of the hamilton jacobi equation, and then again, the optimal control is given by this expression. So can we get rid of... Uh, solving, can we do without solving the partial differential equation? Well, I can define a dynamic value function as a pair. Now, the pair now is given by a dynamical system with input and output. So in the case of stability, this was a system without input and output. It's like an autonomous system, and there is a design problem. It makes sense to have a dynamical system with input and output, and the positive definite function on the standard state space that satisfies uh, this particular condition when this is a complete design parameter. So if we actually, uh, what we obtain, if we apply this approach, we obtain a dynamic control law which approximates, in a sense that we want to, be, to specify in a minute, the optimal control law. And we have actually replaced the, the hamilton jacobi equation by a partial differential inequality, and we'll see what is the cost associated to this in a minute. Okay, so the fact that it's an inequality carries an additional cost, which I call the cost of solving a PDE, and again, I come back to this in a second. So clearly, the additional cost can be minimized in some simple way, because the state C is at my disposal, and we all know that the value function at time zero is the cost associated to the problem. And so one possible way would be to select C such that this is minimized at time t equals zero. It is useful at time equals to zero, but is actually not uh, always, uh, you know, a great selection. So how do we do something better? Okay, first of all, we define what we call an algebraic p-bar solution of the hamilton jacobi partial differential equation, which is a mapping. Again, this is like a row vector with the property that this uh, algebraic equation is like a Riccati equation, uh, is actually solved with uh, an additional cost. So there is some additional cost. And then you have the tangency condition, means you would like to solve the underlying linear quadratic problem, which is given by this uh, Riccati equation. So uh, the partial of P with respect to X has to be at X tangent to the solution of the linear quadratic problem. So if you do all this, then 
you end up again with a canonical construction for the dynamic value function, which is given by this uh, function, v of x of xi, which again is the p of x evaluated for x equals xi, scalar product with x, plus a penalty term. And then this is your optimal control, and this is your essentially the dynamic optimal control. But you see that if you look at this term, minus g trust post p of xi, this is the partial of v with respect to x, at least this part. So this looks like the good old optimal control problem. And then you have an additional term, which is associated with the fact that you're actually extending the dimension of the state, and you're taking a special form for this uh, dynamic value function. So the Gain k can be selected as uh, to minimize the gap between the actual optimal control, you know, the solution of the optimal control problem and the solution of this extended optimal control problem. You can also use an hybrid control architecture, and actually you can prove in some cases that you will approximate the solution to the optimal, to the optimal, you know, the optimal solution to any arbitrary degree. So you get a sort of high frequency oscillation around the um, optimal solution. You can also define the value function in a slightly different way, and with different assumptions, you get essentially the same results. So algebraic solutions can be computed in closed form for large classes of systems. So if you have a feedback system, a feedforward system, mechanical system, and numerically, you actually have to solve a linear cut equation, which is actually an eigenvalue problem. You can do this in a very simple way. Right, so once you have a solution to an optimal control problem, then you know that there's no big difference between an hamilton jacobi equation and an hamilton jacobi isaacs equation, so you can actually look at the Starbucks attenuation problem. And so in this case, you have a similar result where essentially you can prove that you can always, uh, under you know, standard assumption, construct a dynamic feedback which gives you uh, L2 disturbance attenuation for some given gamma, and again, you get Dynamical, you know, a dynamical part, which is the partial of V with respect to Xi, and you have a canonical construction for uh, this, uh, this, the value function associated to this problem. So as a very interesting example, this is one of the very few nonlinear optimal control problems that you can actually solve in a closed form. So this is, um, uh, you know, this is your cost. The value function is a quadratic function, but pretend we don't know anything about this. So we construct the canonical value fa dynamic value function. We construct our dynamic extension, and we observe that the controller is actually parameterized by this parameter alpha. So if you compare the optimal control that you obtain as a function of alpha with the actual optimal control, and actually with the optimal control for the linearized problem, you see that the cost, if you use the optimal solution for the linearized problem, is about 20% higher than the optimal cost. And then, uh, you know, if you start moving this parameter alpha towards its boundary value, you see that you actually approximate the optimal cost arbitrarily close. So you can actually prove that it's always possible to select alpha and initialize the dynamic extension in such a way that your cost is below the optimal cost plus some epsilon. You pick epsilon and you stay below this, uh, this, this threshold. Now, things then get very complicated, especially when you don't know when to put arrows all over the places. So if you're looking at a finite horizon problem, you have an additional issue here, right? So your running cost may be a function of the state and the function of the input. Then you need to look at again at the linearized problem for your finite horizon problem. And then you have to add an extra cost. Now, this extra cost now is a function of the state and function of time, which is part of the state of your system. Again, you define an algebraic solution, and you have a canonical form for a dynamic value function. So this actually solves the uh, hamilton jacobi equation over the finite horizon that you are trying, you know, that you are considering, where you have essentially a solution, which is the solution associated with the linearized problem. Then you have delta x, which comes out of this equation, you have delta tau. And the very interesting observation is that you need to add a penalty, not only in x minus c, where this is your additional variable, but also between the time tau and the sort of new time, right? Because the extended state space for this is, is x and tau. And so you need to add penalties also in this, in this new time. But this is a canonical construction for a dynamic value function. It's quite interesting, because then we were challenged to uh, look at problems where the optimal solution 
is very strange. I mean, it's one of bang, a singular arc, and, and then is equal to 0. For example, this is the so-called Goddard problem. If you try to solve the linearized problem, you end up with you know, maximum thrust all the time, and then you set it to 0 when you're running out of fuel. Now, if you try to do an approximate control, pro optimal control with our approach, you end up with something which actually at some point has a, a, a singular arc. And then you can actually modify the various gains in such a way that you can push these corners in the right position. Actually, this arrow is incorrect. This should have been pointing here, so that you can actually recover the singular arc in this, uh, in this particular application. And then uh, you, know, you can get more and more sophisticated uh, optimal control problem. For example, if you have now a, a game theory problem where you have a dynamical system with two players, each one is his own cost. Then you define Nash feedback strategies, but I could have looked at Stackelberger uh, strategies if I had a sort of a decision pattern on the controller. And so you end up with two coupled partial differential equation. You see that I got this term, which are coupling the partial differential equation, and this is the optimal control, the one that is solving the game in the Nash sense. It gives you the so-called Nash equilibrium solution. So these are coupled PDEs. They are very difficult to solve even in the linear case, but pretend we can do this. So also in this case, you replace everything with a couple of algebraic solution. You have ten tangency conditions, some technical assumption, additional cost. But these are essentially, for each fixed x, this is a Riccati equation. So you can actually solve this online under some specific assumption. So what happens is that also in this case, you have, a, you have a canonical construction. And actually, you can construct different constructions. So first of all, you have a value function for each player. And then we have a shared dynamical system. You could also have a dynamical system for each player. So there are two different formulations of this problem where a canonical dynamic value function is actually constructed with multiple dynamic extension. And again, the optimal control, the Nash equilibrium solution, is what you would expect if you take um, the, the standard approach. And then you have a perturbation term. Observe that I replace x with c here, because if you do this, you simply have a different perturbation term up there. Now, we have run these on a couple of, um, so these are a couple of applications. Uh, yeah, that's fine. OK, so here the problem is that you have a target position for this agent to go inside uh, this uh, group of agents. And you know the only thing that you know is that you don't want to collide. So this is a sort of a safety margin for all agents. And then his final position is the center of this. And there's no other information here. Everyone is his own barrier functions. And then clearly, this problem doesn't have a unique solution. I mean, this could go around here, could be down there. And it all depends on the way you initialize the dynamic extension. Because initializing the dynamic extension, in a certain sense, you break the symmetry of this problem, right? And so you construct a, a solution. So another interesting example is given by you know, two agents that need to swap their position. They don't have to collide, and then there is a tiny passage. So for whatever reason, because I've selected the initialization of dynamic extension in some way, the blue agent is pushing away the red one, which is then going back. But some, the opposite could have happened simply with a different selection of the, of, the, of the initial condition for the dynamic extension state. And then you know, everyone will asymptotically go back to his, uh, to his position. Right. I should have selected the other page. OK. So you could then uh, cast multi-agent multi -agent system problems, such as coverage, collision avoidance, consensus, as differential games. And then, for example, this is a game where multiple agents have to swap their positions. And then uh, they don't have to collide. And this is the sort of trajectory that each one has to follow uh, in order, to, in order to, to, to achieve this particular goal. OK, perhaps I should skip this part, which is not the most interesting part. OK, so this is uh, something which is fairly recent, actually, because feedback linearization is actually associated with the solution. Of, you, know, you need to find the kernel of an you know, the, 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 yeah, the orthogonal of an invariant distribution, well, of a, an involutive distribution. And this is actually non-trivial. So when you try to solve, for example, approximate feedback linearization, 
you use notions like robust relative degree and you try to get rid of some nonlinearities which are inherently showing up at some point in your chain of integrator. So in the case of robust relative degree, you neglect some uh, nonlinearities and you see that you then have a chain of integrator but then are all these coupling terms. And these coupling terms are such that the input output behavior is actually not, not non-linear. Non non-linear anymore. Whereas if you try to do feedback linearization with dynamic extension, you end up with a chain of integrator, but then the output is a modified output, is the output that you would get if you were able to actually find the orthogonal to the involutive distribution, which is constructed as a linear output plus some dynamical system, which is used to compensate for the fact that you have not been able to solve this partial differential equation. So the construction is actually fairly interesting. You need to construct a linear output with the property that for the linearized problem you have observability. Then you need to have non-trivial Markov parameters. So this condition is a generic condition because you know if the only way in which this could not be solved is that if all these Markov parameters were equal to zero. Then you construct your coordinate transformation, which is a linear output, and then you get all these derivatives. And clearly, when you perform all these derivatives, at some point, you get u, because you don't have relative degree with respect to this output. But you really don't care, because then you start adding the variable xi. And so you have a dynamical system, which is sort of delaying u. So this one is compensating for the fact that the system with the output doesn't have a relative degree. And so you have them a dynamic linearizing feedback. This is your input signal. And the input signal is clearly reminiscent of the input-output linearizing feedback, but is constructed using an output which is a linear output plus some compensation term that is there because you have not been able to solve this equation. So you actually have a very interesting uh, control uh, architecture whereby you, know, you have a nonlinear system, then you have your dynamic feedback linearization. Mind you, you don't achieve dynamic relative degree, but you have a zero dynamics. And actually, you can prove that almost all internal dynamics can be assigned. But the input-output behavior for all your variable x is actually a chain of integrator. And then you can apply any other uh, you know, linear design tool in order to achieve whatever goal you want. So the interesting observation is that you need to modify the output with adding an additional term, which is coming from this expression here. And everything can be computed in that expression. And then again, you look at the dual problem. So this is the so-called observer design problem with linear error dynamics. And so you know that if a system is observable, then you have to solve a very fancy partial differential equation to make sure that you have an observer with linear error dynamics. You don't have to do this because you extend your observer. So this is your output. You make this perturbation. And you try to perform uh, you know, all this construction, which is essentially a triangular construction. You don't care that at some point um, you know, these are not really the right function, because you will compensate for any mismatch with the xi dot. Right? So the xi dot will compensate for any mismatch. So if you do this, you end up with an observer, which is essentially a copy of the system plus an additional term, and then you have a nonlinear function, which is partial part of the inverse of the previous function that you have before. But you can compute this inverse because you were linear in all the, you know, the uh, variable xi. So the observer has twice as many states as the underlying system. And you can actually prove that this observer is a sort of low eigen observer. And this has very interesting properties, because you can tune the eigen part to get fast convergence and the low gain part to have noise immunity. So for example, if you have a high gain observer, you will get very fast response towards zero. But then if you have noise, the high gain will actually uh, amplify the noise. If you have a low high gain observer, then you have a similar response, which is you know, this dark line. But then the immunity to, to, to noise is actually, actually much higher, because you are mixing essentially the two, the two walls. Right, so I believe I'm probably done. So. Uh, as a sort of summary, I would say that PDEs are ubiquitous in nonlinear control analysis and design. And I would say that classical solution methods are inadequate or do not scale gently with the dimension of the problem. So you really struggle to go from one dimension to you know, the same dimension plus one. So the idea of dynamic integration, in my opinion, is a curse of dimensionality free. So you don't really set a bound for where you start cursing the dimensional dimensionality. And actually, I've proved the, that this can be used in a, in, in a large set of applications. So there is clearly a cost associated with dynamic integration if you are solving an optimal control problem. But for game theory, there is no cost. For feedback linearization, there is no cost. And so it is a, it is a very efficient tool. Now, we've actually been 
doing quite a lot of other work on this. For example, we have been doing a stabilization of it forward system without solving the so-called forwarding partial differential equation. We design a nonlinear separation principle combining the previous two designs that we have seen. And you know, this is possibly the most ambitious things that I'm trying to do. And you know, I've not actually been very successful on this, otherwise I would have told you, which is setting a sort of approximate calculus of variations uh, using this particular approach. Right, so as a one picture, uh, we get systems and control problem MPDEs. They come together to define a set of algebraic solutions that together with dynamic feedback will be useful uh, as a design tool for, uh, for, for nonlinear control. Clearly, you need some numerical methods because not always these algebraic solutions are easy to compute. But then what you obtain is that you have an online approximation of an ideal control action, which is essentially a dynamic feedback. And you can always try to quantify the cost associated with the fact that you're actually not solved the partial differential equation. Clearly, I haven't done all of this on my own. And so this is a set of people that have worked with me, starting from my good friend Romeo Ortega. And uh, some, all of these are my PhD students. Some of them, they've actually continued in their academic career. So and then, you know, still working with them. So thank you very much for your attention. This is everything for me.